Under the leadership of President and CEO Dan Lepp, Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Michigan has been a recognized leader and partner in a portfolio of statewide initiatives that support the provider community and improve patient care. Leveraging existing consortiums in place for the last 15 years allowed them to rapidly respond to the impact of the pandemic on providers and support the healthcare workforce and their members over the past year. To hear more about their leadership on this issue, we are now joined by Tom Lydon, Director of Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan's award-winning Value Partnerships Program. Tom? Thank you, Catherine. So happy to be here to speak about the Michigan experience. Uh, next slide, please. Or actually, I see I can do it myself. Okay, uh, real quick, uh, I'm going to tell you a little bit about Blue Cross and the Michigan experience because we're a little bit different than how most health plans operate. Uh, we're the lar largest single state blues plan in America, and we serve about four and a half million Michigan members. And the Value Partnerships uh, Program, uh, we have about four, $500 million annually that we uh, reward hospitals and physicians in uh, practice transformation um, to continue to improve quality of care. And I've been with the program 14 years now, and I've always been really proud of what we've been able to do with the provider community. But this last year, seeing how the provider community has been able to respond to the pandemic has just been incredibly rewarding. And uh, I'm so happy to share with you some of the things that we've been able to do. So the Value Partnerships portfolio has supported the provider community for over 15 years now through the development of learning health systems. And there's primarily two um, flagship programs under Value Partnerships. We have a physician group incentive program on the ambulatory side. And primarily on the hospital side, we have a collaborative quality initiative programs, or CQIs. And there's four primary roles that we serve um, for the provider community. Uh, we are a convener of the medical community. And uh, through that, we, we routinely get the provider community together and provide ongoing safe forms for hospitals, physician organizations, primary care physicians, and specialists to address practice transformation needs. And when I say ongoing, I'm talking ongoing. Um, typically, these communities get together on a quarterly basis uh, in safe havens to, to share uh, best practice information in, in an unblinded fashion. Um, practice transformation is, is the primary uh, focus of these forms. Um, we also as the largest health plan in the state, uh, put uh, significant dollars into value-based reimbursement. And we also, uh, as, as the, the major convener of providers in the, the community, have an ability to engage the providers with uh, regards to information, getting information out quickly. And we, we saw this particularly with regards to COVID. Uh, the platform served the state really well in that we had all these existing platforms where the vast majority of the providers were routinely getting together. So when the COVID pandemic hit, it was the natural place for providers to go to get information and ask questions. Um, and that really was a, a great stress relief to the provider community because uh, it, it helped them um, coalesce with their peers and, and get answers to their questions quickly. So the value partnerships view of the health plan role is uh, a, a bit different than some health plans might view uh, their role. We really feel our opportunity is to, is to um, assemble competitive hospitals and physicians and offer a neutral ground for collaboration. We also feel that we have the ability to provide resources to, re to reward infrastructure development and process transformation. And it's all about sharing data and getting information and support to the physicians and the hospitals so that they can do what they are there to do, which is provide the highest quality care. Um, and in this final slide, this final bullet, a heavy hand prompts the provider community to the least necessary. You know, Don Berwick talked about it multiple times in his presentation. Really, it's all about empowerment. Empowerment encourages the provider community to do the most possible. And I, I, can't, I cannot um, emphasize that enough. So the portfolio explained really simply is if you provide the support, the tools, the data, the funding, so physicians can engage in what they actually want to do to improve quality of care, it works. It, it, it helps change the way that healthcare is delivered. 
and ultimately it drives a meaningful impact for the customers, the health plans, the members by improved value of care, better uh, utilization of resources, improved quality of care, as well as improved member experience. So I mentioned there's two of these flagship programs under Value Partnerships, the PGIP program on the ambulatory side and the CQIs on the hospital side. The key takeaway from this slide really is that these programs are designed in partnership with the Michigan provider community. So all these initiatives, they are initiatives that we developed hand in hand with the Michigan providers. Uh, these are not initiatives that we developed back at the office and, and then throw over the wall to the providers and say, have at it. These are efforts that we work painstakingly with the providers, um, it, developing common goals and, and, and working with them to actually implement and we modify as needed uh, to, to continue to promulgate improvements. So this is going to sound kind of surprising coming from a, a fellow who's been leading this program for the last 14 years. While financial reward, rewards are certainly very important, there is really a surprising truth about what motivates us. And when I say us, I'm talking about the provider community particularly. Um, financial rewards are certainly great, but studies have shown better outcomes are uh, found when people are intrinsically motivated. And Value Partnerships programs have long adhered, adhered to many of the principles espoused by Daniel Pink. If you've not uh, read any of Daniel Pink's uh, work, I, I'd encourage you to do so. Um, there's a link in this to a 10-minute video of his that I'd highly recommend you watch. Um, Dan really uh, focuses on three themes, you know, autonomy, the, the urge to direct our own lives, mastery, the desire to get better and better at something that matters, and purpose, the yearning to do what to do in the service of something larger than ourselves. And I, I really do believe that these three principles really help providers, particularly in times of great strife. And uh, again, I cannot encourage you enough to uh, watch uh, his video. It's, it's, it's a great 10 minute video and it really hopefully will change the way that you think about how to engage and reward uh, providers. So through our PGIP program, uh, it's particularly through the last year, uh, we've, we've tried to do quite a bit to help our provider partners through, through the COVID pandemic. Um, at the very start, we had lots of concerns amongst the provider community, um, you know, lots of concerns about you know, patient testing, lab operations, protocols, how to get tests, what the results meant, et cetera. There were also incredible concerns about funding and sustainability of providers. Um, in Michigan, half of our providers are independents, and those providers are often one to three person providers. Um, so we, we worked tire tirelessly to, to make sure that uh, we were uh, changing funding streams and getting funding to uh, independent providers and all providers, frankly, to make sure that uh, they had funding available to them to, to put in uh, place telehealth systems to, to rapidly evolve the way that they delivered care. Um, we also uh, assembled weekly meetings with our provider partners uh, to get information flowing. We invited the state of Michigan and they would routinely attend our meetings. We invited our lab partners. Uh, we invited the state medical societies. Um, we also wanted to make sure that our provider partners understood the CARES Act and, and all the various re regulations. So we continue to provide educational opportunities to our partners to help them to dissect and understand all the various legislation and what it meant to them. Um, so, you know, I, I can't overemphasize the importance of educating people because it, it's great that there's a lot of information out there, but it, it's hard to, to rapidly understand it in, in, in crisis times like this. I mentioned the work that we did in telehealth. Um, in two weeks, we launched a telehealth initiative within uh, COVID hitting the state of Michigan. Um, and within four weeks, four to five weeks, we had over 80% of our providers offering telehealth services. Um, and that's down from 10% uh, four weeks previously. And when I say providers, I'm primarily talking primary care physicians and behavioral health providers. Um, so I'm gonna switch over to our second key program and that's our CQIs, which are our statewide improvement programs that are centered around clinical registries. And our, our CQIs, again, are hospital programs for the most part. Um, these are programs that have clinically rich databases uh, cardiac surgeons, radiation oncologists, emergency medicine physicians, trauma surgeons, et cetera. Um, 
these programs have been around 15 plus years. Uh, long-standing programs where the locus of control is with the providers, and, and that's incredibly empowering to the physician community. And there's solid confidence in the integrity of data, which is also very meaningful to the, the physicians as well. Uh, the data is uh, shared freely at the meetings. It's often unblinded, so uh, you know, no one's hiding behind letters. Um, hospitals are uh, freely sharing what, where they're succeeding as well as where they're failing. And you'll have hospitals from one part of the state sharing their successes and their failures and helping one another um, get over the, the, some of the failures that they've had. Um, Evidence-based medicine typically takes 15 years from the time that uh, a new best practice is discovered until it's actually in place. Through our CQI model, we've discovered best practices where we've been able to implement across the consortium the best practice in as little as a year. And uh, the reason we've been able to do that is because there's such strong confidence in the, the integrity of the data. Um, another one of the key learnings uh, and one of the key supports to the provider community is peer-to-peer uh, -peer review and coaching. Uh, there was a study that came out of the CQIs about four years ago. Um, it was in the New England Journal of Medicine, and it basically we had bariatric surgeons who allowed themselves to be videotaped, and we found through the, the data registries that those uh, peer, those surgeons who were videotaped and had their peers assess their technical capabilities often had less than optimal outcomes when their peers thought that their surgical technique was less than optimal. When we offered peer-to-peer -peer review and coaching, the surprising thing was often those surgeons who had con tech surgical technique that was considered optimal were the ones raising their hands asking to have their peers help them improve their techniques. Um, so, you know, again, surgical, uh, surgical competence doesn't necessitate that physicians want and crave uh, additional support. Um, so it's all about providing resources and support for the medical community to help them to continue to self-actualize and improve. And um, there's a longstanding mantra with the CQI program that quality improvement moves at the speed of trust. I'd say physician engagement also um, moves at the speed of trust. Uh, the CQIs are all about learning. They're all about building an atmosphere of networking, developing shared goals, transforming care delivery. And this next uh, quote is, 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 is the quote that, uh, that really could be said by pretty much many of the surgeons participating. Uh, my involvement in the CQI is the single most influential and helpful activity that I've been engaged in during my entire career. I'll tell you, uh, having attended these meetings for the last 14 years, um, our urology CQI, um, the attendees uh, meet on Fridays from noon to five. It is not uncommon for the attendees to, to still be there at 5.30 on a Friday afternoon on a if you provide opportunities for the collaborative where they find value and it helps them continue to um, build their skill sets, uh, they will engage. So through the COVID crisis, um, we have been able to um, provide resources. When COVID hit, we launched a CQI registry around COVID to help them determine best practices and assess, uh, address huge variation in treatment. And then when COVID started to wane, we helped hospitals uh, bring elective surgery uh, volumes back up based upon data that we had collected. And then when COVID started to rear its ugly head again, um, we started up a 24-7 uh, helpline for ICUs across the state where they were able to call in and ask their peers for information and help 24-7 uh, to help them provide higher quality care. And I'm going to skip a slide or two because I want to share a couple uh, key pieces of information for you about other areas that they've been able to provide support. One more slide. So other areas that the CQIs have been able to provide support, um, we have an oncology collaborative, and they actually did something right before COVID hit which was fascinating, uh, they brought in spiritual leaders from across a variety of different spiritual areas, uh, imams, reverends, rabbis, fathers, Buddhists, spiritual non-religious, 
to help oncologists have uh, difficult conversations with uh, individuals with cancer. And I was there, and I can tell you, you had oncologists um, bringing up cases that they had 15, 20 years prior that had haunted them for 20 years. And they, 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 they were saying things like, I wish I had the tools that you're providing me now because I, I, I struggled so hard with this case, and I, I just didn't feel um, I had the skills to provide this care. Um, additionally, you know, physician burnout has long been an issue. Um, our emergency department collaborative um, it continues to provide resources to ER physicians across the state, um, and, and I've provided links throughout the, uh, the presentation for you. They provided uh, uh, boilerplate uh, letters that uh, ER physicians across the state could provide. I'm going to read you just one line from this. They, uh, this is a letter that they gave to ER doctors that they could tailor for family members, and the letter says, the new pressures of my job will make me tired when I'm at home. I might seem quiet or distant. Remaining strong for people who are hurt and sick isn't easy. I need your help. Just knowing that you think about me brings me happiness. A kind word or a hug from you is like rocket fuel to my day. And it goes on and on. But um, it's all about providing tools to providers when they need them. Um, so, again, we've had webinars. Um, we, we continue to uh, engage uh, providers, we, we're asking providers about burnout, and we're sharing data routinely with the providers to let them know they're not alone. And in closing, I would just share with you a couple thoughts, and, and we've received um, additional feedback uh, that people appreciate this. But my the takeaways for you all is watch the Dan Pink video, Autonomy, Mastering Purpose are incredible internal drivers. Uh, think through your programs and how they support daily empowerment of your teams. Um, you'd be amazed to learn how many people feel ill-equipped to have difficult conversations. Provide the resources to help bridge the gap. Um, look to free up funds and resources during times of crisis. Ask questions on how your teams are doing. Benchmark. Act on the data. And don't assume because the resources are out there that everyone understands the information. And uh, finally, I'd, I would encourage you to empower, empower, empower. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tom, and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Michigan for your leadership. Um, and thank you to all our speakers for these incredibly rich presentations.